Tejasvina vadita mastu ma vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. So as I was saying before, so many of you wonderful people joined. Uh, I have not yet solved the problem uh, of uh, the Kindle Cloud Reader. So I'm going to ask Haima to read for us. And she knows that I will interrupt from time to time and, and uh, say whatever seems auspicious at the moment. So we're studying Swami Prabhavananda's book, How to Know God. It's his translation and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. We're in chapter one, Yoga and its Aim. And I think Haima told me, for those of you who have the book, we're on page 17. So if you would begin, dear, please. Okay. I will go back to a few lines before I start exactly where we supposed to, Brother Shankara. Okay. Just a few lines before. The real self, the Atman, remains forever outside the power of thought waves. It is eternally pure, enlightened, and free. <coughs> the only true unchanging happiness. It follows, therefore, that man can never know his real self as long as the thought waves and the ego sense are being identified. In order to become enlightened, we must bring the thought waves under control so that this false identification may cease. The Gita teaches us that yoga is the breaking of contact with pain. Describing the action of the thought waves, the commentators employ a simple mess image, the image of a lake. If the surface of a lake is lashed into waves, the water becomes muddy and the bottom cannot be seen. The lake represents the mind and the bottom of the lake, the Atman. Hold on then, just there, dear. Sure, Brother Shankar. So, the statement has been made that your essential nature is this form of consciousness or consciousness itself called Atman. The Atman is beyond the power of thought. It's who you truly are. It's where the energy for being you comes from. 
And the reason we don't grasp this, the reason we don't anything more than occasionally intuit this, is that our mind is constantly busy with these thought waves. <clears throat> so it's not that the thought waves are bad and wrong or a problem. It's just as Sri Ramakrishna said one time, using a very homely uh, gesture, he held up a towel in front of his face and said, you can't see me because of the towel. If we drop the towel, if we get rid of the towel, then you can see me. So the Swami just said that the solution for breaking the pain of this separation from our true selves is to learn to control the thought waves of the mind. Any comments from anyone or questions before we go on? Because this is absolutely the key idea of Patanjali's yoga. That you are the Atman. That is your true, original, and essential nature. It is of the form of pure consciousness. It is the, of the form of pure bliss. It is of the form of pure existence and pure knowledge. But it can never be grasped by the mind because of the, the inability of the thought waves, to, of which are finite, to in any way interact with the infinite. So any comments or questions, anything from your own wisdom or experience or any concern or question? Well, what, what you refer to as a simple solution, it, it, it turns out it is not as simple as it appears. Well, dropping that towel, getting rid of that, that mind wave is, uh, is, is, is something that requires a lot of whatever it is it, it, just not easy at all and well it, i think you said the right word there robert it, it's <laughs> simple in principle but it's not easy in practice right absolutely right just exactly that hi Samish here yes Samish. But Shankara, you mentioned that you know the, the real self, the Atman, is you know bliss. It is existence itself. It is uh, so. The the one thought that came to my mind is like, if it is all that, is it also the anger? Is it also the the sadness? Because there's nothing created outside it, right? It has all of this as well. It is it's, that's also. Uh, a nature of uh, Atman itself. Uh, no. Okay. No, Samesh. This is the projection of Maya, all of those attributes that you mentioned exist within Maya. Now, Atman has attributes. There is Saguna Atman but it does not have those negative attributes. It, 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 those are part of the natural consequence of projecting a, a reality, a small r reality, in, of duality.
you can say it is part of the intentions of Atman to project this reality. So it isn't that it would be unknown to Atman that there will be darkness as well as light. But it is not the it is not the uh, Atman's doing directly. Is that clear? Uh, not yes exactly. And no. <laughs> yes and no. Well, of course, yes and no. And the reason being, Somesh, is just as what has been said. The, Atman cannot really be understood by the mind. It can be gestured to. It can be said, yes, there is Saguna Atman, which is described in chapters 4, 5, and 6 of the Gita. But to say that we understand it, no. We, we can realize it. But realization is beyond thought's compass, mm -hmm. beyond thought and speech. So we can't really say what we've been when we return from that state of realization. This is the, this is the mystery and the paradox. <clears throat> Sri Ramakrishna says, just do control the thought waves of the mind enough to come into the neighborhood of God, which is well before this complete realization of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And these questions resolve themselves and uh, the paradoxes uh, don't seem important. That's what he says. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the question aside and let it resolve. <clears throat> right. Okay. Can do that. Anything else from anyone? This this is exactly what a class is for. Um, Shankara. Yes, dear. Yes, Swayam. Oh, um, Balaji can go first. <laughs> No, no, it's okay. Okay. No, I just wanted to bring something uh, for this question of uh, Somesh. I thought this is more in chapter 7 of Bhagavad Gita. There is a shloka, 11th shloka. Actually, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to... Of the strong, I am the strength devoid of desire and attachment and in all beings. I am the desire Unopposed to dharma, O oh best among Bharatas. So he, he is that one, he's the Atma, but devoid of all those things, all that anger and unethical things and all those things. I just, I thought maybe that would uh, give some, you know. Thank you, Balaji. Thank you, uh, yeah. That's why I'm. Yes, um, I was just going to add that um, that's why these classes and discussions are so meaningful and helpful because we keep churning these thoughts over and over and are able to then apply them in our day-to-day -day life circumstances while continuing the practice and hopefully one day the Atman will be revealed. One day we will have sufficient thought control of the thought waves of the mind. Yes, that is the point of the practice. And there's no sense despairing or being frustrated or impatient. Until that happens, we are eons old. We are so, uh, the mind is so full of impressions, habits, ways of being and thinking, that it takes a long time, as Robert Ayers was pointing out a little while ago. Uh, it, it's, it is absolutely not easy to 
gain control of these thought waves. But you don't have to have full control of them, <clears throat> just a great deal of control of them, but not full control of them. In other words, they don't have to cease being in your attention altogether before <clears throat> you experience Savikalpa Samadhi. We'll get to that as, as the Swami develops his case here. Brother Shankara? Yes, Frank. Um, what you're talking about right now reminds me of a part in, uh, I think, um, what, what book did the Bhagavad Gita come from? The Mahabharata. Thank you. Um, there's a part in there that I relate to a little too much. I don't know if anyone else does, but uh, Krishna is having a talk with the evil cousin, not Arjuna, but his enemy. Duryodhana. Yeah. And Duryodhana says to him, I know what to do. I just can't always do it. Yeah, I know all of us talking right and wrong. I just can't. And that that whole conversation of when he, <clears throat> uh, my heart actually went out to him. I actually empathized with him because he felt like a prisoner in his own gunas. Like yeah. I know what to do, but I'm stuck. I I just can't do it. I don't want to think these things, but I think them. I don't want to say these things. And I just, that just touched me so deep because I really, really related to him um, more than I wished I did, but I really related to him. Well, you know, this is, uh, Arjuna also related to them. That's why he developed the, the attitude that he did that caused him to put down his weapons. These were his cousins, his kinsmen. He knew them, he understood them. He knew that kind of thinking that you just mentioned. And so, but Krishna tells him otherwise. Brother, that is, uh, I'm reading this uh, book called Flow by Mihaly uh, Csikszentmihalyi. It's like a Hungarian philosopher and uh, it seems like, okay, there are some people who turn to spirituality, which is probably more difficult for most people, but maybe there's also another way where you like doing something which is creative, like, you know, you know, simplest form is running and people have experienced like when the challenge is so hard that you are forced to focus and concentrate, there's no scope left. Like you can't do the thing unless you completely concentrate. Then you sort of, you, you can, sort of attain something in that? Well, this, uh, this is a different way of seeing the ideal. It's not the way that Swami Prabhupada is going to give us the ideal in this book. Yes, there are many different ways of seeing these things and in pursuing these things. Otherwise, why would there be so many books on the shelves? But we're studying this one because the idea is that Swami Prabhupada knows something that if we are, are able to assimilate it, will help us on this spiritual path as formulated by the lineage that this class is part of. So there, but there are many other lineages to study. Uh, it's good not to study too many at once. As Sri Ramakrishna said, don't dig shallow wells here and there. Dig a deep well in one place and see if you don't strike water. Hmm. Thank you, Rajiv. You, you, it's, it's true what you say. There are other ways of going about this, other ways of thinking about it. Anything else from anyone before we read on? 
to expand on what Robert said about control of thought waves, um, that's a struggle I think we all have, and it comes up in the Gita too, doesn't it? When oh, Arjuna absolutely. Uh, you know, Arjuna complains to uh, Krishna, the, the wind is no wilder than this mind of mine. And Krishna says, well, yeah, that's true. But if you keep at it, you can get it under control. And that's why Swami Prabhupada's second and third instructions for meditation are patience and perseverance. Patience and perseverance, right. And the fourth instruction is expectation. Expect that as you patiently persevere with your practice, that it will yield fruit. So thanks for bringing that out, Brahmadas. Yeah, that's good advice. Patience, perseverance, and expectation. I like that. Yeah. So I would, I'd like to comment on what just Rajiv said about what many can be characterized as what sometimes premier athletes reach their zone. And when they're in their craft or athletes are running or playing tennis or hitting the perfect golf stroke, they get into their zone and maybe they get into that, uh, that state of mind where they lose track of time, space, etc. something Somali-like. But that seems to be an experience that not everybody can replicate. And even those athletes may not be able to replicate. And that zone may not be the real uh, look and feel of Somali, but it may be something Somali-like. Yet, I'd like to just read probably the last sentence here in this book. But every mind, every mind no matter what it presents nature, can ultimately be disciplined and transformed can become, in Patanjali's phrase, one-pointed and fit to attain the state of perfect yoga. So this what, is What the, book is that you're reading? Uh, this is this, our book. Oh, okay. It's, Same book. Okay, and it's one, uh, it's uh, the last sentence bef uh, on the sutra number two. And yes, well, uh, what I'm trying to contrast is that while being in the zone and while uh, playing a musical instrument or something else, you may get into the zone that may be Somali-like, but this is all ad hoc. Uh, Patanjali probably gives us a much more sure shot uh, way, and that's why we are here studying. And that's exactly what Brother Shankara was uh, alluding to. Yes, that zone is a very special place for musicians and athletes, and anyone else who, uh, even chess masters, you know, they do lose uh, sense of self. They do lose sense of time, space, and causation. They are just immersed in the moment. And it is a kind of samadhi, but it won't lead them to freedom because that's not what they're after. They're after some other goal. So we pursue the goal of spiritual freedom by pursuing what Swami Prabhupada teaches us. And that zone, the zone that we're seeking, Samadhi, Savikalpa Samadhi, as Swami Prabhupada would say, people would want to talk to him about Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And he would say, well, dear, first, well, he would say, my child, well, my child, first achieve Savikalpa Samadhi. Then we'll talk about Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Savikalpa Samadhi is being there. All thought waves have disappeared except one great thought. One great thought, and that is the thought of the divine itself in manifestation. That is Savikalpa Samadhi and it pushes everything else to the periphery. 
We'll get to the, all of that. But thanks for bringing that up. Okay, hi, well, go ahead, please. That over again, Brother Shankara, those few lines seem to be very inspiring. Describing the action of the thought waves, the commentators employ a simple image, the image of a lake. If the surface of a lake is lashed into waves, the water becomes muddy and the bottom cannot be seen. <coughs> the, the lake represents the mind and the bottom of the lake, the Atman. When Patanjali speaks of control of thought waves, he does not refer to a momentary or super, superficial control. Many people believe that the practice of yoga is concerned with making your mind a blank, a condition which could, if it were really desirable, be much more easily achieved by asking your friend to hit you over the head with a hammer. <laughs> no spiritual advantage is ever gained by self-violence. We are not trying to check the thought waves by smashing the organs which record them. We have to do something much more difficult to unlearn the false identification of the thought waves with the ego sense. This process of unlearning involves a complete transformation of, a, of character, a renewal of the mind, as St. Paul puts it. One more time, this process of unlearning involves a complete transformation of character, a renewal of the mind, as St. Paul puts it. And this, this renewal of character comes with the practice of the yamas and niyamas, practice, as practice, we'll practice. see. Then we begin to be able to do successfully the other things. It isn't that it's sequential. We begin to practice the other things, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, all of this at the same time that we're, doing, that we're transforming our character because it's good to practice those things too. But the underlying transformation is changing from an attitude, the adversarial attitude of I, me, mine, which is represented by the ego sense and our identification of our thought waves with the ego sense. How does this affect me? Changing the I, me, mine to thou, thee, thine, which if you look carefully at the niyamas, the observances that Patanjali recommends, you will see that that's what that portends. That's what is involved, is beginning to think thou, thee, thine, rather than I, me, mine. Okay, go ahead, please. What does yoga philosophy mean by character? To explain this, one may develop the analogy of the lake. Waves do not merely disturb the surface of the water. They also, by their continued action, build up banks of sand or pebbles on the lake bottom. Such sand, such sand banks are, of course, much more permanent and solid than the waves themselves. They may be compared to the tendencies, potentialities, and latent states which exist in the subconscious and unconscious areas of the mind. In Sanskrit, they are called samskaras. The samskaras are built up by the continued action of the thought waves, and they 
in their turn, create new thought waves. The process works both ways. Expose the mind to constant thoughts of anger and resentment, and you will find that these anger waves build, build up anger samskaras, which will predispose you to find occasions for anger throughout your daily life. Definitely. A person with well-developed anger samskaras is said to have a bad temper. The sum total of our samskaras is, in fact, our character at any given moment. Let us never forget, however, that just as a sandbank may shift and change its shape, shape if the tide or the current changes, so also the samskaras may be modified by the introduction of other kinds of thought waves into the mind. While we are on this subject, it is worth referring to a dif difference of interpretation which exists between yoga and Western science. Not all samskaras are acquired during the course of a, of a single human life. A child is born with certain tendencies already present in its nature. Western science is inclined to ascribe such tendencies to heredity. Yoga psychology explains that they were acquired in former incarnations as the result of thoughts and actions long since forgotten. It does not really matter for practical purposes which of these two theories one prefers. Heredity from the yoga viewpoint may be only another way of saying that the individual soul is driven by existing samskaras to seek rebirth in a certain kind of family of parents whose samskaras are like its own and thereby to inherit the tendencies which it already possesses. The yoga aspirant does not waste his time wondering where his samskaras came from or how long he has had them. He accepts full responsibility for them and sets about trying to change them. There are, of course, many types of mind which are not yet ready for the higher yoga practices. If you have a flabby, neglected physique and try to take part in a class for ballet dancers, you will probably do yourself a great injury. <laughs> you have to start with a few simple exercises. There are minds which may be described as scattered. They are restless, passionate, and unable to concentrate. There are lazy, inert minds, <clears throat> incapable of constructive thought. There are also minds which, though they possess a certain degree of energy, can only dwell on dwell on what is pleasant. They shrink away from the disagreeable aspects of life. But every mind, no matter what its present nature, can ultimately be disciplined and transformed, can become, in Patanjali's phrase, one-pointed and fit to attain the state of perfect yoga. One more time, I'll read this, Brother Shankara. But every mind, no matter what its present nature, can ultimately be disciplined and transformed, can become, 
in Patanjali's phrase, one pointed and fit to attain the state of perfect yoga. Okay, so let's take the, the, the example of the person with the scattered mind, unable to concentrate. <clears throat> that person may get a great deal done. They may be constantly busy and very well-intentioned and, and do, a, do a lot of work in the world. They're not as effective as they could be, <clears throat> but because of their hard work and their good intentions, they get a lot done. <clears throat> but they won't be able to make any progress in spiritual life until they begin to <clears throat> correct that scatteredness of the mind. The same thing is true of, of the lazy person. Now, lazy people, Swami Swahananda really didn't like that word. He said, people aren't lazy, he said. They're just unmotivated. They have no zeal. Uh, he, he didn't like to be critical of people, even by implication. Lazy implies something's wrong with them. He just said, no, it's not that. It's that they have no motivation. They have no zeal. Give them some reason for zeal. Show them something that makes them want to move. And suddenly this lazy person will become very active. Mm. So we mustn't think ill of others. This is what Swami Swahananda was pointing to when we encounter those people who have scattered minds, we have people that we encounter those people with lack of motivation. No, just how can we, as Swami Vivekananda says, how can we lend them a hand? And if there's no way that we can lend them a hand, at least don't be in their way. Hmm? Uh, see if you can bring a smile to their face somehow. This is part of the transformation of our own character from being judgmental and adversarial to being cooperative, seeing that we're all in this together, no matter what our condition, and seeing how we can be serviceful to others uh, in such a way that transforms our character. As Swami Vivekananda is at pains to point out, being serviceful is not about doing good to others. It's about doing good to yourself, <laughs> changing your identification from being selfish to being other-centered. So are there any comments or questions about what's been said so far? The yoga aspirant does not waste his time wondering where his samskaras came from or how long he has had them. He accepts full responsibility for them and sets about trying to change them. That's good advice. And well, he it says- is, it, 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 is the, it is the core of, uh, Patanjali's start, you know. And before that, he says, expose the mind to constant thoughts of anger and resent resentment, and you will find that these anger waves build up anger samskaras. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> and if we struggle, us... so those of us who struggle, I, I do find I'm having these thoughts of anger and resentment for stuff that happened like 20 years ago. It's not good. How well, can it's, we... it's, it's, it's fruitless, isn't it, Brahmadas? It is fruitless, and I realize and that. What, can, what can we do about what happened 20 years ago? But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And I certainly understand from my own personal perspective. 
I mean, I just posted something on Facebook this morning that directly ties to this. So, so when we see these anger waves building up inside of us, it's almost out of our control and it will build up the anger some scars, which we don't want. So how it's not you... out of our control. That's the thing. What, what is within our control? Mother, this is Sri Ramakrishna's prescription and Swami Prabhupada does. Mother, take thy pleasantness, take thy anger, and give me pure love for thee. Become thou the thine centered rather than I me mind centered and these kinds of thought waves become less of an issue for us. So it's our way out of here is always through some deliberate action. There's nothing passive about spiritual life, nothing. And I mean that so very literally. There is nothing passive about it. It isn't just being nice, being pleasant, being passive in, fa in face of the world's, <clears throat> what the world confronts us with. No. Thank you, Brahmadas. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean it, if you want to know what I, what, well, you can, you can go on the Facebook page and look it up if you like. Oh, well, I'll comment on that unless you know what I thought. Okay. I just want to make one comment, Brother Shankara. This is Haima. Please, yes. A uh, lot of times we humans have more power over our thoughts than we think we don't have. We yes. really do. But sometimes it may take a friend or a counselor or somebody to shift us thinking in the right direction. What is it going to do for me 20 years ago that happened? It's all done deal. <laughs> Somebody... And logically, it doesn't make any sense, but emotionally, right. it comes up and like, I can't believe this person did this to me. I should have said this. I should have said that. <laughs> right. The, there's but the logical that's... part of you, and then there's the sure, emotional part. Sure, sure. But you have the power to change that part. It just, it takes a lot of work, like running, practice, practice, practice. That's what <laughs> like I'm trying meditation. to do. That's why we're here meditation. today. Meditation. That's why, here that's, today. That's, that's, why they're, that's why we're here today. So let's let's mm -hmm. go ahead let's. with that if there aren't any other comments or okay. questions from me. Sure. Uh, I just want to kind of see if this applies or not. But I think Buddha said that, that you're given two arrows. One arrow that comes from the uh, you know the landscape or environment, which you cannot do much about. But the second arrow is within you and how you react to it. So again, the something that happened 20 years ago is an arrow that came about but what you do about it is within your response and that's the second arrow amen and to brood about the past is one of our one of human beings most fruitless wastes of time to brood about the past and dream about the future are two ways that we simply waste our time. Now, does that mean we're being bad and wrong? No, it just means we're being human. But that's what we're learning to control as we do this. Well, first we learn to see the mind doing that. Oh, I'm brooding about the past again. Oh, I'm dreaming about you know, next summer's vacation again. You know. So then, then you, you see your mind doing it, then you restore the mind to a more productive frame of, of, of being, way of being, by saying, does this deserve my attention? Now, what deserves my attention right now, this moment? And then you will see as, as we get to the niyamas, <clears throat> that those the, the first, that restraint of the mind from doing the fruitless thing is a yama, restraint. 
Then the niyam, what do I do with the mind to make it more productive and particularly to advance my ability to control the thought waves of the mind and to be more spiritually successful. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, that's absolutely right. Brother, I have uh, one interesting observation is, uh, I, I found lately that it's very easy to overcome like, uh, it's very easy to overcome these troubles by sort of remembering uh, Ram Krishna. I mean, if, if that is like, you know, people are comfortable with that, like remembering him. And the other thing I observed is uh, like fire. If you imagine fire in, in, in yourself and sort of, you know, these, all these impurities or whatever, just throw that into the fire and pray that these get transformed into its, you know, it's like, it's like the Vedic sacrifice. Well, that there is, there, there is, a, that is a prescription in one of the Upanishads. Take these thoughts, these feelings, these these things that you don't want and and burn them in the fire of sacrifice yes and and then you can imagine that ram krishna is the is the priest of i don't know you, you can make things up i mean it's or, the imagination or, but... or the fire itself yeah i think that's um, even more beautiful <clears throat> thank you Rachel. So, yeah. if i, if I, I, I want to add one two one. paragraph go ahead go. If I could go two paragraphs back, and I think, Brother Shankara, you were talking about how yama and niyama could help us unlearn the false identification of the thought waves with the ego sense. And my question there is, is it really yama and niyama, or does any of the higher uh, levels of the eight uh, strong path also help, like pratyara or something else? Well, of course, that's why I said we practice them all together. It isn't, it's not sequential. The six okay. limbs of yoga that are within our self-effort or control, the first six limbs, we learn them and then we practice them all together. But we will not be very successful, particularly in learning to divorce ourselves from the senses and learning concentration until we keep the mind from being constantly agitated by thoughts of I, me, mine. That is a fact. And so the, the more we are in that adversarial attitude toward the world, I have to insist on getting my own. I have to insist that I am taken into account. I have to insist that I get what's coming to me. As long as you have that constant agitation of the mind that are involved with that kind of thoughts and that kind of speech and that kind of behavior, the ability to concentrate will absolutely elude you. Thank you. Somebody else wanted to speak at the same time. There were two people talking. Yeah, uh, that was me, Brother Shankar. Yes, yeah, Omesh. You know, in all this conversation, I'm really present to the word scattered mind. That, uh, you know, there are, uh, so I share, there are things that happened in the past for me as well. And I just realized it, it was not in my presence. And in this conversation, I realized that, uh, uh, my uncle had done something and I was still, I didn't realize I was carrying it with me. And the moment I realized that it was the scattered mind to which he probably did, or, you know, that was his going on. And I made it mean that he is this kind of person. So that means he's not scattered anymore. He is like fixed this kind of person. And that uh, just took away everything while, you know, that, that, that that's a, uh, that's my way or my my meaning out of it that that he is that 
and that's what I'm carrying till now, and not just uh, you know that okay, it was at that moment he did that, and that was and probably I I do many things like that as well in my life, and somebody can make me in any of that. So yeah, I'm yeah. really present to that. It's not a scattered mind that did it. There's a wonderful Zen story that is a metaphor for this. Mm -hmm. An old monk and a young monk are walking along. They come to a stream and they see this young woman who wants to cross the stream, but doesn't want to get her beautiful garments wet. So the old monk simply picks her up and carries her across the stream puts her down on the other side. And then the young monk, and the old monk walk, walk on. After a time, the young monk says, we're not even supposed to look at women, let alone touch them. What in the world were you doing? Picking up that young woman and carrying her across the stream. And the old monk says, are you still carrying that girl? I left her by the stream. Are you still carrying that girl? I left her by the stream. So there's there's a lot in that story beyond just the control of your thought waves, but control of your thought waves and, and being aware of your thought waves is very much a part of that story. Mm -hmm. So we, if we're still carrying something from, you know, having crossed that stream even many years ago. Yeah. And I mean, it's not as if I don't know what I'm talking about here. It isn't as if I don't know this happens. Of course it happens. So this is this is why we practice and practice and practice and practice. <clears throat> Anything else from anyone before we go on? Well, Brother Shankara. Yes, dear. So if we do not succeed in letting go, do these thought waves then um, go when the subtle mind, um, if it reincarnates? This is what we're told. If they don't become dormant, then they become active in a in a further in a future incarnation. Also, we may not know the specifics. They come to us as some sort of intuition, some sort of some sort of foreknowledge of and predis, predisposition to think about things in certain ways because of things that have happened to us in past lifetimes, positive and negative. So yes, that's the short answer. Brother, there's an interesting insight that I, that I personally got from my sufferings in life, and I'm sure it's applicable for everybody is, Whenever we experience suffering, it torments us. But the other aspect is that whenever you experience suffering, you should actually be happy because this is an opportunity to skip one life. Like there are two responses to suffering. Like either I spend the rest of my life sort of entangled in it and then, you know, it's wasted. And then I continue with my journey, the next birth. But this is a door. And if I can find the key to open this door that I'm freed and, you know, I, I sort of skip this one birth and in this way if you if you keep on encountering you know suffering then they they will make you skip those births that you are supposed to yes live. there is a saying pain is not optional suffering is a choice please read on dear okay aphorism number three then man abides in his real nature. That's the subheading. When the lake of the mind becomes clear and still, man knows himself as he really is, always was 
and always will be. When the lake of the mind becomes clear and still, man knows himself as he really is, always was and always will be. He knows that he is the Atman. His personality, his mistaken belief in himself as a separate, unique individual disappears. So say the last again. His personality, his mistaken belief in himself as a separate, unique individual disappears. Yes. Patanjali is only an outer covering, like a coat or a mask, which he can assume or lay aside as he chooses. Such a person is known as a free, illumined soul. Number four, at other times when he is not in the state of yoga, man remains identified with the thought waves in the mind. Number five, there are five kinds of thought waves. Okay, Some let's, pain, let's, let's hold it there. Okay. Um, because um, it's, uh, it's, it's 12.56. And uh, I just want to uh, the, the, read that one when he's not immersed in yoga, number four. Number four. Then man abides in his real nature. So when read the, it over from the beginning. Okay. When the lake of the mind becomes clear and still, man knows himself as he really is always was and always will be he knows that he is the atman his personality his mistaken belief in himself <laughs> as a separate unique individual disappears patanjali is only an outer covering like a coat or a mask which he can assume or lay aside as he chooses such a person is known as a free illumined soul. And number, that uh, number, number four, four, at other times when he's not in the state of yoga, man remains identified with the thought waves in the mind. Okay. And this is, is part of our inheritance from past lifetimes were told. It's called our Parabdha Karma. And if you want to understand how it is something, it, this exactly what uh, was just said in number four here, read the last two chapters of the Viveka Chudamani, Shankaracharya's workbook for Advaita Vedanta, in which he says that even for the illumined soul, as long as they remain embodied, this Parabdha Karma will, uh, will arise as thought waves in the mind. And so they have to be constantly vigilant. So we'll start with number five next week. Anything else from anyone? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. So when uh, somebody becomes illumined, they have a choice to leave the body or stay to uh, for the part of the karma to uh, work itself out? The, the answer is yes and no. It depends on whether they have a mission as we'll hear from Swami Vivekananda, when he experienced Nirvikalpa Samadhi, and I say experience, that's not the right word, when he was in the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he said there was this tiny bit of ego remaining that brought him back so that he could do his work so that he could fulfill his mission. It, 
if you're if you're finished apparently then you can either leave immediately that is to say not resume the the form that you left and as you entered this state of highest samadhi or <clears throat> if there's just some tiny little bit of parabda karma unfinished business uh, you may persist for as many as 21 days but it's only those who have a mission now according to those who have a mission they say the mission is not their choice it is a commission from the divine thank you so they're left with that ego of wisdom or ego of love or both in the case of Vivekananda and so what he said when asked why he was being who he was uh, in February of 1896 he said I have a mission to the east I have a mission to the west as Buddha had a mission to the east and that's why he didn't leave the body in June of 1895 when he experienced or entered that second samadhi, Nirvikalpa samadhi. Anyone else? Anything at all? I probably have a tactical administrative type of question. It's more in the sense, can a Kindle version of the text as we are reading be flashed on the Zoom screen? It might actually make things easier versus looking at the book or looking at another screen and the screen at the same time. I, I, I don't know about that. And uh, I what, can help you with that. Well, you why, don't you, the, why don't you uh, send me an email? I'll forward okay, it to uh, I'll forward it to our person our, our, who takes care of these things. My vision is not up to uh, doing these technical things so someone named cindy craven is uh but you you forward it to me uh okay. and then I'll, we'll I'll i'll respond to you and uh, and copy cindy craven and we'll see uh it's a it's a good suggestion thank you thank you and not to correct you, Brother Shankara, but it's your eyesight that prevents you from that technology. Your vision is perfect because it's your vision that brings us together as seekers today, doing this thing that we do. And I love, I love the, the, the illustration that uh, Sri Ramakrishna does with the towel, uh, where he holds it up. And for me, these times with you and my brothers and sisters is opportunities to see the towel pulled down just a little bit that's what happens for me on saturdays and sundays during these times together the insights that we share together feels like a pulling down of the towel so i get to peek over it but it's got one of those spring-loaded things maya takes over but these are the <laughs> opportunities loaded i love it well, uh, whatever happens here, uh, we'll just say it is the will of the divine as expressed through all of us. We are all that one. We are all that one. No matter how it appears to us at this moment. And it's joyous that it appears to us that these many people that are represented by these screens here. 12, 13, 14 of us, something like that. How joyous. Being, creating, doing, sharing, the joys of these is why we're here. When you are truly tired of this, just sign off and head for home. So the sharing that we're doing is, is joyous.
The doing that we do together is joyous, but it's done in the knowledge, the full knowledge is passed down to us and is held as an article of faith that there is truly one here. And that's why Chaitanya says, take no honor to thyself, give honor to all, chant unceasingly the name of the Lord. So, <clears throat> Om Asatoma Satgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya, Mrityorma Amrutangamaya, Abir, Abir Moiti. O oh, dearly beloved, lead us from this realm of noisy confusion an everlasting delusion to thine abode of serenity, silence, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through, light us through and through with thy everlasting shining presence jai shri guru maharaj ji ki jai durga 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 may you be safe may you be healthy may you be cheerful may you have peace of mind let us go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and so tomorrow morning, we will, uh, uh, by Zoom, just click on the Sunday Talks uh, and Special Events uh, link, and we will have a puja in celebration of the birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda. Uh, that will be started by uh, a reading of a slightly expanded version of the text that I was asked to offer uh, last Sunday at that uh, webinar sponsored by the Academy of Yoga and Meditation. Then there'll be some songs and uh, there'll be also, uh, of course, the full puja conducted by our beloved Pujari, Aditya Chaturvedi. Uh, any final comment or question from anyone? All right, we'll take it up with aphorism number five next week. And uh, we'll see whether there is the opportunity to do this fine thing of uh, having the text up on the screen for us all. Even so, we'll have a reader, but uh, all right. And thank you for those sweet words, Amadas. Always in the knowledge that we are. We are the Atman. We are that one. Until next time, dears. Thank you, Shankaraji. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Thank you. Is that Frank? Uh, you're most dear. welcome here. Raji. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.